Hello and welcome to this quick review of chromatography to A-level. Um, you'll need to have your completed independent study and notes in front of you while we play the clip. And the clip will focus on the two main techniques that are covered on the A-level specification, that is thin layer chromatography and gas chromatography. So the basic idea behind chromatography is that it's a separating technique. You get two phases, a mobile phase and a stationary phase. Your mixture contains um, a number of components and each component will have a, a favoured phase that it tends to attract to more compared to the other. And this attraction will be due to its uh, main intermolecular forces that it exhibits as a substance. These might be London forces, they might be uh, permanent dipole-dipole interactions for example. It's important to remember that chromatography doesn't identify individual components which give their, um, their actual identity. So because of this, uh, we often use it in conjunction with other techniques, uh, maybe spectroscopy or some test tube functional group analysis in the lab, to give ourselves a fuller picture of what might be in a sample that we're trying to analyse. So there's lots of uses of chromatography. Um, for example, flavourings analysis, drugs analysis, uh, exa any examples really of common mixtures of organic molecules. Um, you may be interested to know that it's used in particular in forensics quite a lot. So let's look at thin layer chromatography. Um, most people find that it's uh, uh, quite easy to understand because it's similar to the paper chromatography that, that most people end up doing at school at, uh, at some point. So. So a TLC plate um, consists of a small rectangular piece of plastic that has silica powder coated on one side and the silica powder acts as the stationary phase. So a thin line is drawn in pencil uh, near to one end of the, um, of the plate. And it's drawn on the silica side because you want the components uh, to be in contact with the silica. The next thing to do is to use a thin capillary tube, a separate one for each sample. Uh, several tiny drops are added to a specific place in the line, and this builds up a spot, as you can see. So we've got four spots in this graphic we're using. So the TLC plate is now put into a solvent tank and covered. The solvent can be a range of different things, dependent on what you suspect might be in the sample. Solvent mustn't be touching the baseline where the spots have been placed, so we now leave it. So a short while later you can see what's separated out. So the blue component hasn't um, separated, so this must be a, a pure substance, assuming that the solvent has been chosen correctly. So the solvent itself will have also moved up the plate, and it will carry the different components at different distances. And I've indicated this by the grey area on the diagram. So we can now use these different distances to work out the degree of separation. So to analyse our chromatogram, we work out the RF value for each component. So the distance moved by the component is just divided by the distance moved by the solvent. And I've added two uh, arrows to the diagram, to the chromatogram, to see how you could read these off and calculate it for the yellow component. So the yellow arrow will be the distance moved by the yellow component, and the grey arrow will be the distance moved by the solvent. So if we focus on the very edge of where the solvents travel to, uh, we call that the solvent front, as I've labelled it on the diagram. So if we take the RF value to represent the distance travelled by the component divided by the distance travelled by the solvent. So looking at it mathematically, obviously the further the component travels, the bigger the number you get. So the higher the RF values. So we can conclude that a higher RF value indicates a greater attraction for the mobile phase. Therefore a low RF value must indicate a greater attraction for the stationary phase. And just a little reminder at the bottom of what the two are. The stationary phase is the silica on the plate. The mobile phase is the solvent.
So the spots that have travelled, or the components that have travelled further, um, they have greater attraction for the mobile phase, and the components that haven't travelled as far, such as blue, and it's dark blue, uh, they have a greater attraction for the stationary phase. So let's now move on to the next uh, type of chromatography. So looking at gas chromatography, um, this is a technique that's often followed up by mass spectroscopy for the identification part of the process. But the gas chromatography part of the process will separate out your components and your mixture. So in gas chromatography, I've uh, done a very simplified version of a, grass chrom a gas chromatography machine. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There's uh, three stages. There's injection, uh, separation, and detection. So first of all, let's have a look inside the column. So inside the column, there'll be a solid outer layer that keeps the integrity, the structural integrity of the column in place. There'll be an inner mobile phase, which is uh, usually quite a viscous liquid. And what happens is the carrier gas will move through this column. So in the diagram, I've indicated uh, where the carrier gas is moving through the column using a grey arrow. So obviously this will come from a tank of some kind that will be attached to the column separately to the injection port that I've labelled. You can obviously find better diagrams than this in textbooks and online, so you can check it for yourself. I've just tried to keep it fairly simple if I can. Um, so you have injection of your sample, separation using a carrier gas which is inert, moving through a column which is lined with a liquid uh, stationary phase. The carrier gas acts as a mobile phase and what happens is the separation is dependent on whether the component is attracted to the carrier gas by intermolecular forces or whether it's attracted to the liquid stationary phase by intermolecular forces. So what we're looking for is the retention time and this is the equivalent of the time spent in the column by a component of the mixture. So by looking at the relative retention times of different components, we can make um, not just uh, information about the separation, but we can also say what's happening in terms of the intermolecular forces. So a longer retention time means the component has dissolved readily in the stationary phase liquid. So that can tell us a little bit about its intermolecular forces. Likewise, if it has a shorter retention time, that means the component hasn't dissolved in the stationary phase and instead has been carried along by the mobile phase, which is your inert carrier gas. So again, we can make deductions about its intermolecular forces and possibly its structure. Now, I'll be careful saying this because in red I've said it's often followed by mass spectroscopy. So the, ab the absolute identification has to be done by another method. This is purely a separation method, but quite often what we find is the structure that we actually end up um, deducing using chromatography combined with spectroscopy. Uh, the retention times often support the likely intermolecular forces that you would associate with that structure. So what I'm trying to say is that chromatography doesn't give us the identity absolutely but the retention times do give us clues about the relative amounts of intermolecular forces present, particularly if we know what the chemical identity of the stationary phase and the mobile phase are already. So the gas chromatogram that we get printed is a plot of uh, retention time on the x-axis against relative intensity on the y-axis. So if we have component A and component B. The areas under the peaks represent the amount of each component present. So we can deduce that A has a greater attraction for the mobile phase because its retention time is shorter and B has a greater attraction for the stationary phase because its retention time is longer. So even though uh, chromatography doesn't give us uh, information such as concentration directly we can do this by plotting a calibration curve. So what you do is you make up a series of standard solutions 
and these standard solutions have to be different concentrations. So you run each one through the uh, chromatography machine that I've left the diagram of on the screen and that will give you a relative peak area on the chromatogram. You take the relative peak areas and that makes up the scale on your y-axis. So the relative peak areas go on the y-axis, concentration goes on the x-axis and what you end up with is a straight line like I've indicated. So using the peak area of your sample of unknown concentration, you can use the calibration curve to extrapolate this back to the concentration on the x-axis and therefore calculate its correct concentration. Right, so that takes us to the end of our review of chromatography to A-level. Hopefully it's been fairly useful and uh, it's given you a little bit of an introduction to not only thin layer chromatography but also gas chromatography and how we can use uh, calibration to help us get quantitative information from chromatography. So until next time, thanks for your time, thanks for listening, and see you soon.